I'm Max Kaiser. Welcome to another episode of Bit Block Boom. This is Gary Leland, and you're listening to episode 143 of the Crypto Cousins Podcast. Feed your interest in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies by joining Hall of Fame podcaster Gary Leland on the Crypto Cousins Podcast. And remember, we are all cousins in the world of crypto. Max, how you doing? Yeah. Great. Great Gary, welcome. good to see you. You know, I haven't seen you since Las Vegas before yeah. lockdown. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, Tone just barely got that in. It's unconfiscatable. What do you get that in by like a week, maybe? Yeah, we were uh, just staying ahead of the wave, staying ahead of the tsunami, staying ahead of it, the, the pandemic as it went global. You know, we were, wow, it's crazy times. Now we're all on lockdown. Yeah, I think we met before that on the roof at Christian's in San Francisco. That's where I met yes. you and Stacy originally. That was a, a good time, also a lot of good meat there. Um, uh, that was a good, good. That was a good, 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 good program there at the. Uh, I think that was Bitcoin Magazine. Yeah, Bitcoin 2019. It's a shame they had to cancel 2020. I was really looking yeah. forward to that. Really, really bad. But uh, oh, yeah. yeah, welcome to the show. Like I said, um, I was you know doing some research on you before you came on the show because you know I, I I've known you and I watch your show a lot you know, you and Stacy on the show a lot, but I didn't, I've never really researched you or found anything out about you personally. I just knew from watching the show uh, that you've been in the financial markets for quite a while, but you've been doing the Kaiser Report since like 2009? Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. 2009 Kaiser Report. Before that, we were doing television shows with kind of thematically the same for BBC and other networks around the world. So we've been doing TV uh, for 15, 16 years. We've been doing podcasting for probably 17 years. Usually, it's all usually the same theme, the same, you know, banksters, bankers, global finance, and taking an insider's look at what goes on at banks and how do they really, you know, make money and what really happens. Because I worked on Wall Street for many years and uh, Stacy brought her TV producing chops to the game. And so we put those two together. That's the formula that's worked now for a long time. We all seem to make a perfect couple. And you both seem to me, I mean, I've only met you in person twice. to both be really nice people. So I guess y'all have a good life together there uh, in your hideaway, wherever you guys are, are, are in seclusion at. Well, yeah, it's great. You know, uh, we're, we, we're traveling really nonstop for, for our 17 years, really. So now we're, you know, now we're on the uh, lockdown, so that's, but that's working out great too. So, you know, we always figure out a way to make it work. So let me ask you a question. How did you get into Bitcoin originally? I know you probably get asked this a lot, but I don't know, and my audience may not know, but you found it early, I think, because you were telling people to get it. At, may, may I, I think I've heard you say you were telling people to get it at like 50 cents or something, you know? A uh, dollar, a dollar. So uh, we heard about it in 2011. On Kaiser Report, we had uh, John Matonis was on the show, and he introduced us to it. And, uh, you know, I have a patent for digital scarcity uh, that, I, that was filed in 1996. And it covers virtual currencies, digital scarcity, digital market making, visual securities, digital uh, securities. And uh, so I already knew about this concept of digital scarcity and how it applies to networks and markets. And uh, that was sold. It was part of a business called the Hollywood Stock Exchange. And the Hollywood Stock Exchange, the business that I created, was sold in 2001 to uh, Cantor Fitzgerald on Wall Street. And they, they used that patent to trade derivatives and other types of virtual securities. So that's, so when I saw the, uh, heard about Bitcoin in 2011, I was immediately, uh, you know, figured that wow you know this is this is uh, such a such an improvement over my attempt to to create digital scarcity so so you already knew then when you saw bitcoin it just made sense to you already you didn't have to sit there you know most and I, i'm not sure but i assume you're close to my age i'm 65 so i assume you're a boomer most boomers i meet just can't even get a concept of what bitcoin is i don't want to say they're stupid but they have a hard time with the concept of money that's not backed by anything, even though the dollar's not backed by anything. So they have, they seem to have a hard time with that, but you right away got it because you were already involved in that world, I guess. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it's not the question of what backs the dollar. The question is what backs gold, really. That's the question. When you ask about what backs Bitcoin, you have to ask, well, what backs gold? I mean, the dollar is nowhere part of the conversation. We already know that that's not even worth discussing, really. But it, what backs gold is the question and what backs Bitcoin. So, yeah, when I saw it in 2011, I already had this idea of, digital scarcity and had been working on that for a, for a number of years. Of course, Bitcoin is distributed digital scarcity, right? So that is a whole nother, you know, technological breakthrough and a whole nother suite of techn technology and the stack that is the Bitcoin stack is multi-layered and has a lot going on. So, I mean, I had an affinity for it right away. Uh, but it's not to say that I understood it immediately. You know, it still takes uh, quite a bit of uh, work to dig into the tech stack and get familiar with it. And um, but like, it, nobody needs really to go down that rabbit hole uh, now because it's been around for 11 years. It's established itself. Um, you know, just like the TCP IP protocol runs the internet, people don't question that. They they just accept it. Nobody knows how that works. If you ask a million people on the internet today to explain TCP IP, uh, you would get a million blank stares, right? They don't have any idea how it works. So nobody really know, needs to know how Bitcoin works at this point. Uh, the fact is that it does work. It's challenging gold. And we see now this global hash war where countries, the game theory that's baked into the protocol has jumped to the sovereign level. So now you've got Venezuela and Iran are now getting into Bitcoin in a big way. This will bring in other players. And now you've got countries mining Bitcoin strategically, increase the, the security, uh, and then that increases the price. So, you know, we're in this new 2020 period where we're going to see some fireworks. Well, you covered a lot of stuff there. Um, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I want to go back to first, though, to what you said, because I found that real interesting. What backs gold? Let's go into our conversation on that real quick. Um, tell me uh, more about that conversation. What backs gold? I mean, because to me, I always say when, when people are telling me and they compare it to gold, you know, well, I know gold is scarce. I go, I don't know. They've been mining that stuff since before Jesus was born. And it doesn't look like they're running out yet. And now they're talking about meteors and stuff. So uh, what backs gold? What's the, tell me that, because let's have that conversation. Well, uh, gold is scarce. And um, it is <sighs> scarce. Uh, it's, it's distributed scarcity, right? Gold is scarce, and you find it all over the world. And then it has other properties, like it's portable, it's desirable, it's fungible, it's divisible, it's impossible to counterfeit. And so you add that all up and it becomes money. And it's been money for thousands of years after many trials and errors. There have been many types of attempts to create money, but only one has really evolved to be the main money now, uh, you know, up until Bitcoin. And that has been gold. And it is, uh, the scarcity factor is a huge factor. If, um, you know, there are, there's, a, there's an attack vector, if you will. I mean, there could be meteors with gold. There could be meteor mining. There could be uh, mining in uh, ocean water. There's a lot of gold in the oceans. That could be somehow uh, mined or converted, you know, harvested as gold, and the supply would, would go up. Uh, but those are, uh, the market doesn't price those things in. The market is aware of that, but... At the moment, um, it doesn't give it a price because it's not a risk that is worth uh, impacting the price of gold. Uh, if, in fact, there was, if those things came to existence, if, if suddenly meteor mining of gold was viable at a, at a cost that was practical, then you would start to see that reflected in the price of gold. But for all intents and purposes, at the moment, the scarcity factor of gold is primary driver of what makes it money. And uh, you find that with uh, Bitcoin as well. You don't have that with fiat money, obviously. There's no scarcity at all in fiat money. Uh, and so that's why it's not really money. It's a currency. It's a state currency. It's a government currency. You can. It's a medium of exchange, but it's not technically money. Uh, like gold and Bitcoin are money. So, so... But as gold gets to, if gold reaches $3,000, $4,000 an ounce, that opens up a revenue of gold that was too expensive to get before. And now 
I guess that gold starts getting mined and that's kind of an attack factor that brings the price down. Well, I mean, it, sure. I mean, you get, you get to the stock to flow model, right? So as it applies to gold, that's where stock to flow was first applied to gold. The, the amount of, uh, you know, the mining of gold around the world uh, is uh, constrained to some degree by the fact that there are fewer and fewer big gold deposits that are being found. The one in South Africa, the gold mine there, I think is the biggest in the world, is so deep, they're you know, starting to hit lava, right? They're, they've, they've gone down pretty much as far as they can go down. Uh, so you've got this concept of peak gold. Uh, you know, there's, it's, fi it's hard to find gold deposits. They're not finding big ones anymore. Uh, there's, a lot of it's already been pulled out of the ground. Uh, if the price goes up, then you do have more mining activity and that would impact the price. And though, all those things have been going on for hundreds of years, thousands of years. And that's, but the, at the net result is gold has been uh, a good store of value and good money for a long time. And it's, you have to, focus maybe less on the supply issue of gold and focus more on the supply issue of fiat money, right? So if, if the world was on a gold standard, you, you would have a much different type of economic reality. But since we're on a paper money standard, that the, the paper money is, is exploding exponentially. Even if the supply of gold were to suddenly double in a day, the supply of paper money would expand by 100x. You know, in the next, you know, the, the supply of paper money is expanding exponentially, right? I mean, the Fed printed six trillion dollars in a weekend <laughs> just a few days ago, right? I mean, so even if the if gold discoveries increase by a a, a, a noticeable amount, you know, two percent. Let's say the average supply expands from two or three percent. Let's say it goes to five percent or six percent, right? It doubles, which would be an extraordinary increase in gold mining if it doubled. Uh, but uh, the paper money is expanding by by leaps and bounds, many, many multiples of that. And that's why we own gold, is to protect us against paper money. It, 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 it maintains its, its store of value, right? So right. Uh, it's, not, it's not, you're not owning gold just to own gold. You're owning gold because we live in a fiat paper world. That's why we own gold. That's why we own Bitcoin. So... Uh, whatever the supply issues might be with gold, keep in mind that the supply issues for paper money are extraordinarily much more, uh, you know, voluminous. Well, how about uh, another statement you just made about Iran and Venezuela now getting into Bitcoin? I think that's a pretty big topic there. I mean, I've been seeing articles like yesterday in Venezuela, you can now get passports with Bitcoin. I mean, it's starting to work in the societies. How do you think that's going to affect Bitcoin uh, and the United States in the long run? It's great because um, in, in, in built into the Bitcoin protocol is that game theory. And you see it in the mining space where the, the, the global mining center of gravity, you know, has moved around. It used to be in Eastern Europe. Uh, now it's, uh, there's, there was a big uh, concentration in China. That's breaking up. And we're seeing more happening in the United States. And so because that's the game theory as, as, as in, in operation, people are willing to take a risk mining and throw resources at it. Uh, and um, because of the greed factor, it, that's uh, human nature that will never not be with us. And then um, now it's jumped up to the sovereign level. So states like Venezuela and Iran who have been subjected to uh, censorship of uh, with U.S. dollar transactions, uh, either censoring the SWIFT system for moving money around or sanctions, this type of thing. Uh, they are trying to figure out how to escape U.S. dollar hegemony. And uh, in the case of Venezuela, of course, they first uh, experimented with the Petra, which was their own cryptocurrency, which they've realized that actually is never going to work. And now they've migrated to Bitcoin, which is exactly what we predicted would happen. This is what is happening. In the case of Iran, uh, I think they've got 3% of the global hash rate at the, at the moment. They realize that it's a strategic reserve and it's a way to bypass U.S. dollar sanctions and it's a way to get hard money and uh, they have cheap energy. So they figured it out. So, you know, the world history 
you know, is very dynamic. You know, the winners, today's winners are tomorrow's losers, right? We can't, just because you're a winner today doesn't mean you're going to be a winner tomorrow. Just because America's had an empire for 100, 100 years, 100, you know, certainly since World War II, let's call it 70 years, uh, doesn't mean America's going to have an empire next month, right? Things change. Yeah, Rome, the Roman Empire lasted 500 years and it still disappeared. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, things change. And and similarly, they, they messed around with their currency, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, the denarius. <laughs> Right, and that brought down the, the Rome. So America is fooling around with it with with the U.S. dollar, the world reserve currency. And that's not good. That we know from history that usually ends catastroph catastrophically. So you know, so it's I know that both Iran and Venezuela have been uh, um, left out of or attacked by the financial system, like they can't use SWIFT and things. But also, you know, both of those countries have cheap energy. So do you think now that we see countries with cheap energy mining that would move to Saudi Arabia and those countries next where they have cheap energy? I think so. I think that's a good way to look at it. And uh, as soon as this, uh, because the other countries, if they look at Iran and they look at Venezuela and they say, wait a minute, if these two start controlling a bigger piece of the global hash rate, they could be the richest countries in the world. We can't let that happen, right? That's game theory. So yeah, maybe Saudi Arabia pops in and says, hey, let's start mining Bitcoin. And at some point, you're going to have part of the G7 countries or G20 country is going to say, hey, you know, we got to get in on this. You know, maybe Germany or somebody, uh, they'll subsidize the mining. Um, and um, But that's where we're headed. And that's what's happening in 2020. I think that's going to be the biggest story of 2020 is the global hash war, as I call it. So. How would the U.S., you think, approach that? Would they just uh, start mining, try to figure out a way to shut it down with a 51% attack? Or would they just say, print the hell out of this money and start buying Bitcoin? <laughs> right. Well, you can't shut it down with a 51% attack. And I'll get to that in a second. But um, what they'll do is it will be like that Sputnik moment where America entered the space race, right? First, Russia put up a satellite. Then America said, oh, my God, we can't let them win the space race. And so we put a man on the moon. So America will wake up probably at some point and say, wait a minute, we can't lose the global hash war because that's the most important thing going in, in the world today. So they will uh, put a lot of money at it. Hopefully they'll be able to, and the, the economy won't be t completely destroyed before they make that decision. But if they can print $6 trillion to bail out some dodgy bankers on Wall Street and do that in a, in a weekend, Right. I mean, they can print six trillion dollars to go big, mine Bitcoin. Well, I would right? think they, they could print six they trillion dollars to go buy it. <laughs> well, they can they can buy it. Right. They can mine it. They can buy it. Sure. Now, as far as the 51 percent attack goes. Um, we're there. There is there is no possibility of a 51 percent attack at this point from any country or any group of countries. Uh, the you know, again, Getting back to game theory, the way the protocol is designed is it attracts people to attack it. It attracts people to attack it. And they, it, that's part of the way it works because it increases the um, security of the protocol, in fact, uh, which, which is by, by having all this additional uh, computational uh, resources thrown at the mining process. And then this, of course, drives the price higher. So the price of that 51% attack keeps going higher because you keep attacking it. So the more you attack it, the higher the price of the coin goes, the more expensive the attack becomes. And you never get to the point where you can afford to make the attack. So I, I, I fully invite every country in the world to attack it. This is how we get to four or $500,000 a coin. You need the United States to do something stupid, like say, we're going to attack Bitcoin. That'd be awesome because we'd be at 200,000 on Bitcoin the next day. Well, that would be sweet. <laughs> I do have to agree. That, I'd be very happy if that happened for sure. Hey, before we go any further, I want to make sure everybody listening knows about BitBlockBoom, the Bitcoin conference coming to Dallas, Texas. And I call it a Bitcoin conference because it's not a crypto conference or an alt chain conference. It's a Bitcoin conference. But go to bitblockboom.com and take a look and see what you think. This will be our third year. So bitblockboom.com. Uh, Max, something you've talked a lot about, you and Stacy talked a lot about on the show that I'm not sure I completely understand. And that's one of the things I'm reason I'm asking is to educate myself, which I do a lot of these shows to educate myself. And hopefully other people get educated at the same time. Explain to me 
the cantillion effect. I'm not sure that I have that down. And I'd like to understand that. All right. Well, it's uh, based on a, an economist uh, by that name of Cantillion, And he observed that when government prints money, it's not evenly distributed. It doesn't go out evenly across the economy. It goes to basically those uh, who are friends of the government or friends of the bankers first. They have use of the money immediately. And um, in the case of, let's say, the banks on Wall Street, they would take that money that the government prints and buy back their own stock. And then that makes their executive stock options go up by thousands of percentage points in a month. And then they have, and then so that so that's what happens first. Uh, and that and the money stays in that very close circle, right? It stays in the bank and it stays in the executives of the bank, and they create the a multi gazillion dollar bonus for themselves based on that free money. Uh, then. Uh, there will be uh, a need for that group of people who uh, just became instabillionaires to hire some cooks and hire some chauffeurs and hire more uh, gar gardeners for their estates, right? And then that's when the money reaches those people. So that a trickle right? down effect, supposedly? It, yeah, it gets diluted. It gets constantly diluted. The contained effect is that the money purchasing power gets diluted. Uh, as it works, as it's distributed out to the periphery of the economy, uh, and it creates a, uh, an in a wealth gap and an income gap because the first users of it are able to engineer extraordinary wealth gains. And by the by, the time it gets down to the gardeners and the chefs and the people running the uh, the taxi drivers, uh, they they don't have the same opportunity. They're just now at this point hand to mouth existence. So is. And would an example be of that is how much money the banks and corporations got right now while the average person got 1200 bucks or whatever? Right. The banks got billions, hundreds of billions, and the average person got 1200 bucks, right? So that's a good example right there, right? And months that's, have gone by. I mean, it's not like it's been a week. It's been months. Sure. And they've only gotten $1,200, and he can't go to work. They're locked right. down. Right, well... Yeah, in, in, the, in the 2008 crisis, you had a huge bailout of the banks, not the, not the debtors, but the creditors. That's the cotillion effect. They said the, credit, the, the, the creditors uh, are at risk of going out of business, even though they made all these faulty, dodgy loans. So we're going to print a bunch of money and bail them out. But it won't circulate through the economy to create any kind of wealth for anybody else. And we see that in the uh, money velocity chart. So the money velocity chart for the past 20 years has gone straight down. It's almost getting near zero. That's the impact of the contain effect. It doesn't circulate. It doesn't, get, it doesn't escape the immediate circle of the bankers and their friends, primarily other bankers. So the central bank comes to the rescue, but to rescue certain people, basically. Yeah, as the, in a capitalist economy, there's a competition going on. It's called competitive free market economics. And the competitive economy ends up with some losers, people who are not competitive, and they get weeded out. Um, for example, banks that made bad loans, they, if it were a free market capitalist economy, they would go out of business. And then those banks would be replaced by new banks, and hopefully new banks would know how to run a bank better and do a better job. But in the United States, bad bankers are rewarded for failure. And bad corporations now are rewarded for failure with free money. So you have uh, almost 20% of the S&P 500 are corporations whose interest costs on their debts are greater than their profits. And the response by the central bank is to keep rewarding them with more debt money, more debt money to actually increase their debts. Why do they do that? Because they get a fee. They get a fee uh, packaging all these bad debts and trading them back and forth. And it's a multi hundred trillion dollar industry that generates a few percentage points in fees. But a two 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 percent on a one hundred trillion dollar bond sale is, you know, is real money. Yeah, it's a lot of money. Yeah, it's real money. It's two trillion dollars, right? So if you, if you could make $2 trillion by selling $100 trillion with a worthless government debt or corporate debt, think not, without any, uh, uh, you know, without, without any um, restrictions or 
legal ramifications, uh, you why not? So because of the way this money's been handled, I mean, you know, this whole situation of printing money, giving it to the people that are closest to the top, the people at the bottom getting watered down money, as you say, or not getting much at all anyway, that's pretty much causing inflation and justice and what we're seeing happening right now in the world, like in Seattle, you know, uh, taking the six block area, all the unrest because people don't have any money and they're getting pissed off and they figure out what's going on. I mean, um, is, is that what we're looking at? Is that the, well, the effect case, of, of the, is that the effect of what's happening? Well, I mean, just to roll it back for a second. So you mentioned inflation and, uh, you know, this is a widely misused term, uh, as is deflation. And the problem is deflation. And let me explain. So the bond market is in America hasn't been this high in the 240 years that America has existed. The bond market in the UK has not been in this this high in this the kind of a bu the bubble that the bond sovereign bond market's in in over 300 years. So to fuel this multi-hundred-year bond bubble uh, requires uh, this perpetual infusion of more debt money, right? All fiat money is debt. And it's all being created to support this ever-growing global bond bubble of debt. And that's deflationary because it has an enormous weight on the global economy uh, of being in indebted. It's just like any an individual would want to, you know, if you're in a lot of debt, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to be, you know, operate, to become profitable. Well, in the planet Earth, you know, is uh, the debt, the GDP for the global economy is like over 300%. And that's growing quite rapidly. Uh, in America now, the debt, the GDP is well over 100%. So it's a debt, it's a deflationary, th th these debts are constantly going bad. Right. Every every day, insolvent American government debt, instead of it said the problem is that because of its because it's becoming insolvent. So the government creates more debt money to hide the fact that and to try to kick the can down the road and to mask the the insolvency. It's an it's an insolvency problem. They claim it's a liquidity problem, but it's not. It's an insolvency problem. So the American economy is insolvent. The global economy is insolvent because of deflation. Because it went bankrupt, because it, it because it died in two thousand and eight. So, and the cure has been um, more debt deflation. Now, when you talk about prices going up, that's something that's something else. That's the result of price gouging and market failure. The reason healthcare in America is up so much is because of uh, market failure and price gouging and extortion. The reason student uh, costs in America are so high is because of extortion larcenistic behavior of banks, mafia pricing, mono, uh, monopoly pricing, uh, and market failure. It's not inflation in the sense that the economy is heating up, wages are going up, and, there's, uh, and, and bond markets are uh, trading down. That's not, that's not what's happening. That would be inflation. That's not, that's not what's happening. What's happening is a deflationary, a rolling deflationary catastrophe that's being met with a tsunami of more debt money. And opening up and ruining competition, ruining the economy, and giving rise to a mafia black market economy of healthcare executives, uh, university executives, and other and other folks that are operating like an unlicensed, um, you know, mafia. The mafia pricing is what is what people are seeing, and they say, "Well, that's inflation." Just to be clear, that's not inflation in the classical economic sense. That's inflation, like, like. If you're if you have to borrow money from uh, a gangster and he charges you a lot for that money, that's you wouldn't say you wouldn't say to the gangster, stop being so inflationary. <laughs> you know, you'd be like, give me my money or I'm going to blow your head off. Right. It, it's not like Paul Krugman uh, or Nouriel Roubini. You know, it's they're gangsters. So when you say, oh, why is my health care going through the roof? It's because you've got gangsters. They're not. They're not economists. They're not operating in a free market economy. 
Yeah, I always said when I put my kids through school, I was always amazed because it was going up 10% a year. And I always go, wait a second, I understand this. That land's paid for. Many of those buildings have been paid for for 20 years. They're tax free. They don't pay taxes because they're state switching. What in the hell is going up so much over there to make this go up 10% every year? And it's just because yeah. they wanted more money. Extortion. Yeah, there was no other reason except they wanted money. And the same thing you're saying is the, right. true for medical. The, 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 fac the faculty, uh, by and large, doesn't, is not making more money. The students, once they graduate, they are not really making any money. So why is the cost of education going up? You know, yeah. We know that because it's subsidized through the government, uh, through Sally May and student loan uh, you know, facilities, and that's subsidized by central bankers who are being given trillions of dollars of free money. And we, now we're back to the Cantillion effect. Right, right. Now I want to go over something else. I heard, I think I heard you today. I'm not sure if this was your latest episode. Uh, last week I interviewed Isaiah Jackson with uh, Black Amer Bitcoin and Black America. And I heard you making a statement on a show, one of your shows over the last few days, that the number one thing, you were agreeing with Isaiah basically, the number one thing that's going to help uh, uh, America is buying Bitcoin and taking money away from the bankers. That that's going to cause more damage and more good to black America than burning statues, I think is what you said. Uh, I don't know if I got that correct and so um, exactly, but you were just making a point that buying Bitcoin would be, and that's what Isaiah says, that buying Bitcoin would be a great thing to help out, not blacks, but everybody. Right. So in the case of Black Lives Matter and the civil rights movement in America, that's been again, active for more than 200 years, going back to slavery days that extend back to before even the creation of the United States. Uh, one big problem the black community has had and all people of color have had and minorities have had in the United States is that their wealth is confiscated uh, quite often. Uh, certainly in the black community, their wealth is con confiscated. Uh, we've seen uh, in the 2008 housing crisis, uh, the black homeowners were um, unusual, you know, they, they were eviscerated uh, from banks. Make, they made fraudulent loans to these families. And then when uh, the government came around and they bailed out the bankers, having made those fraudulent loans, and they took the homes away from uh, black community, and uh, well, lo and behold, you know the biggest landlord in America now is Berkshire Hathaway. You know Warren Buffett, who inherited suddenly as a gift from the federal government thousands and thousands of housing units. Uh, I guess because he sent them a nice Christmas card or something. I'm not sure why Warren Buffett is always getting these gifts from the government, but he there it is. Uh, and so Bitcoin is unconfiscatable. So if you want unconfiscatable wealth that uh, nobody can take away from you and you want to build store of value, and you want to build wealth, uh, Bitcoin offers uh, unconfiscatable wealth. This is the first time ever in history that we've had the ability to uh, save our wealth in an unconfiscatable store of value. And um, that's, that's my message. And I've been saying that since 2011, when Bitcoin was a dollar. You know, I, I reached out to the black community immediately and said, you know, this is something that the black community should be looking at quite seriously because the protests uh, are not working and trying to get into political power is not working. No, you know, it's not working. Nothing's working, but this will work. Definitely. Uh, and just like people in Venezuela or elsewhere in the world are figuring out that they need to get out of us dollar hegemony. Uh, so too in America, the black community is figuring out, you know what, we're oppressed by the U S dollar fiat system as well. And the only way to stop the oppression is to have our own individual sovereignty. And the only way to do that is with Bitcoin. So, um, yeah, I think that's exactly what, you know, you're seeing signs now. Or I've seen Twitter posts of signs, Bitcoin, you know, at rallies. I saw a person talking about it the other day at a rally. Me and Isaiah were talking about it. So I think the word is starting to move through America that uh, Bitcoin is a needed item to help us stay secure and sovereign. Uh, or keep the people sovereign, I guess, is what we'd want to say. Yeah, I want to ask you a question. What's the deal with your uh, Twitter handle? <laughs> you lost your Twitter oh, yeah. handle. You got it back. I don't understand what happened there. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to figure it out. Well, back in uh, September of 2019, uh, my Twitter handle stopped working for me. And um, 
I went through all the usual customer support and uh, it just hit a blank wall and then nothing would happen. And uh, I, my, my, my belief is that somehow that's a bug on Twitter's part there. It looked to me like a database contention issue or somehow I got trapped in a loop, a database contention loop. And um, it, I just wasn't getting anywhere to get this thing working. You know, I sent them uh, two dozen roses and a box of chocolates to Twitter headquarters. And I said, you know, can you resolve this software issue you have on your on your end? Because uh, it's annoying. Uh, then, Did you uh, actually my friend send did, them roses and chocolate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from 1-800-Flowers, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, so I sent it to Twitter headquarters. And um, then a couple of weeks later, I was talking to my friends at Swan Bitcoin. Yeah, which is uh, kind of a startup, and I'm now working with them. And they're like, uh, "Let me see what I can do." So um, they got on the case. They, well, I'm not sure exactly what they did, but uh, lo and behold, the error was was fixed, and everything was working fine. So and that was a few weeks ago. So I just started working again. Well, you know, I'm one of the early advisors with Swan, so I'm a big believer in Swan. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. Uh, a matter of fact, I just set, got one of my best friends set up on Swan because I couldn't get him into Bitcoin. I kept telling him and telling him, I said, "Look, just start buying a hundred dollars worth of this a month, a week, or whatever, so you have yeah. some skin in the game, and then you'll start watching it." I think that helps people a lot when they just get some skin in the game. And totally. I think it's a good way to get some skin in the game without having to watch it, without having to like watch the market and you start seeing what's happening. There's not. There's the easiest way on ramp. To Bitcoin is Swan Bitcoin, and it's cheaper than anybody else. Uh, it's a great company. They got great content, great educational materials. People who are running it are, you know, really hardcore Bitcoiners, great folks. And um, yes, I can totally recommend it to anybody. Uh, no coiners, you know, potential Bitcoiners. As you say, you know, you can just sign up to buy ten dollars a week or. Hundred dollars a month or something, and um, you know what's the, what's your downside there? Not not nothing really. But once you start to get into it, you you then it starts to work on you. I always say that you don't change Bitcoin; Bitcoin changes you, right? Once you once you allow yourself to be influenced by the magic of the protocol, stuff stuff happens. Well, I think you're right on there. Once you start getting involved with it, uh, you go down that rabbit hole whether you want to or not. You start getting. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, um, before we shut off and go out of here, where can people follow you? Where can they find your show? Give me the the scoops because I I I actually didn't watch your show until I met you in California, and then I started seeing your show, and I said, "Oh, that's the people I met in California. That's how I, (laughs) you know, you know what I mean." I'm going, "Oh, I know them. I met them. Let's see what their show's about." And then I became kind of addicted to your show, and so tell people where they can get addicted at. <laughs> well, of course, my Twitter handle, Max Kaiser. Stacy's Twitter handle is Stacy Herbert. And the Kaiser Report has a Twitter handle at Kaiser Report. And most people just watch it on YouTube. So if you do Kaiser Report, search on YouTube, you can find it. It's also dubbed into Spanish now for three or four years. And it has huge following in Spanish speaking countries, really. It's just taken off incredibly. We get hundreds of thousands of views every episode uh, dubbed into Spanish. Uh, so, you know, that's because in the Spanish speaking world, like in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, the message of what we're saying, hard money and Bitcoin, it, it's real to, to people there. Uh, in America, it's going to be probably the last country to really join the Bitcoin bandwagon because this is the empire, right? The people in Rome were the last to really appreciate the um you know, the barbarians were attacking, right? They didn't believe it. Uh, Marie Antoinette was in denial up until that last cut of the sword, right? Uh, the people who run the empire are never are the last to uh, hit, to understand. Yeah, even Hitler in his bunker, I think he was still planning to win right before he pulled the trigger to blow his brains out, right? But they had the denial was still there. So in the U.S., it's like, no, the U.S. dollar is never going to topple. It's the we're the king. We're never going to lose. But you know, I don't. I don't. It's the if the if the U.S. dollar is what you're 
hoping is what you're banking on. You know, you got some, you got some problems. People look at me like I'm crazy when I make any kind of statement that correlates that to all, at all. That says something like, you know, I think the you know, we were looking to buy a house, and a, my friend asked, said, you know, I think we're just going to wait like a year. This is just way too volatile a market right now for us to be buying a house. I'm able to get those houses at 30% off in a year with the way everything is going. And yeah. he looked at me like I was crazy. I mean, what are you talking about? And I was like, do you not keep up with what's going on? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, this is uh, this. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, this is not this is not where you're going to find, uh, except for the black community in America, because they need it, because they've been, uh, you know, uh, under under the, uh, you know, uh, suppressed and oppressed by the dollar for uh, the entire you know existence here. So they and they, you know, they're getting it. They get it that, that this is where we're going to see a big move. So before we get out of here, first of all, I appreciate you coming on the show and taking the time with me. I really do. Is there anything I want to make sure before we close this out that there's not anything you wanted to cover that maybe I missed or you wanted to promote that I didn't give you the opportunity um, since you were kind uh, enough to come not, on here? Not really, no. Okay. It's all good. Let's go with it. I want, <laughs> I want to hang it up and go, you never asked me about uh, something. And I go, oh, gosh, I didn't know. So, hey, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I try to make sure I give you a chance to cover anything you want to cover, I guess. I think we got it all, really. Hey, I do too, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. I really do. Um, I was, I was wanting to ask you those questions. A lot of times, they're questions I want to know. So I figure I'm pretty average Joe. I figure if I like something or I'm curious about something, there are a lot of other people probably that are curious too. So uh, well, we always have a lot of fun when we're together, Gary. When yeah. we're at these various events and stuff, we're usually usually in the green room, hobnobbing and sharing notes, and uh, you know, having some fun. And uh, it was a pleasure being on your podcast. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. I really do. And yeah, that's the only issue. With, you know, I told my wife earlier in the year, I said, I'm going to go to more events this year than I've ever been to. And I had her all set up. I think by now I was going to be at like 10 events and I've gone to one, which I saw you at was Tones Conference. So this yeah. year didn't turn out anything like I planned. That's for sure. But I, <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time though to come on the show. Um, I really do. And uh, I, uh, hopefully I get to see you at something soon. Hopefully we get all cleared up and we get to see something soon. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank you, my friend. Thanks so much, guys. See ya. This is a bitblockboom.com production.